to 14, thinking about what it means to be sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. We'd have quite the wrong idea about the Holy Spirit if we imagined that he was invented on the day of Pentecost, or that the Spirit had never been at work before the ascended Jesus poured out his Spirit in fullness and in power on the church. There has never been a believer in all of history unless God, by his Spirit, worked in that life. There has never been blessing. There has never been illumination. There has never been understanding. There has never been a prophecy that came from God to one of the prophets apart from the work of the Holy Spirit of God. God is one. And God, when He acts, Father, Son, and Spirit work together. And so the Spirit is present in creation, and you read that in the opening verses of the Bible, that the Spirit is moving over the face of the waters as God is forming matter and creation. He creates by the Word of His Son and by the power of His Spirit. Father, Son, and Spirit create, and Father, Son, and Spirit redeem, rescue. So these verses we've been looking at over the last two or three Sunday mornings about the wisdom and plan of God to bring people to Himself, Jews and Gentiles, from Asia Minor, from Ephesus, from the region round about, that is the plan of God, Father, who purposes and calls, Son who suffers and dies and pays the price of redemption, and Spirit who works the change in the individual, who works faith in the heart, who applies the cleansing work of Jesus to the whole church renewed in Him. It is a beautiful picture indeed. And what we've got in these verses 11 to 14 is in particular the idea of inheritance, that part of the story of salvation is that men and women who are Christians are in some wonderful way the heirs of God. They are the inheritors of God's goodness and blessing. So that outburst of praise and blessing that flows through these opening 14 verses of Ephesians, that what we've been calling a baraka, a a blessing, a prayer of blessing or a declaration of a, a benediction. Blessed be God and blessed be those who know their God. Blessing on you from eternity past to eternity future, through the will of God the Father, through the redemption that's in Christ now, through the sealing of the Holy Spirit, that blessing culminates with the idea of inheritance. And there are two sides to this inheritance, as it's taught in Ephesians 1, 11 to 14. And they're amazing we would maybe want to go straight to our inheritance. What we might hope to inherit from God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, who love and call us to be His people. What will God give His heirs? But Paul begins with a wonderful and radical idea that God inhabits and inherits his people. That God gives to his Son, the church, as his heritage. That Christ presents the redeemed church back to the Father as a gift to the Father, and that the Spirit dwells within the church so that the church can be the temple of God made holy and presentable to be given up to God for God's service. 
So the place to start today is to think about God's plan of salvation and to think of Christians as those who are chosen, first of all, as God's inheritance. The church, the believing community of Jews and Gentiles brought together in one new community, these are those chosen by God to be His. And God says over them, they are mine. And that's not something Paul invents as a new teaching because you can go right through the Old Testament and see again and again the loving, tender language of how God related to Israel and says, Israel's my firstborn, Israel's my chosen, Israel's my inheritance. Israel is mine. And this blessing is now extending from Israel to all the Gentile nations. And Ephesians 1 and 2 especially are stressing how God is including the Gentiles in the plan of God, the ancient plan of God. This is part of what God has pre-horizoned, predestined. This is what He's planned that he would work lovingly in Israel and from Israel then work lovingly among the nations so that nations become God's heritage. Nations become God's inheritance. So notice with me verse 11 and verse 14 where we see the heirs of God who are also heirs for God. Verse 11, in him we were also chosen. Now, I want you to notice that there's a footnote there. In the NIV translation, there's a, the letter E there, and if you go down to the foot of the page, it says that this word translated as chosen can quite properly be translated as or were made heirs. In him we were also chosen, or in him we were also made heirs. The idea of this word, it's not wrong to translate it as chosen, but the, the basic meaning, the range of meaning of the, the language Paul uses there has to do with the casting of lots. It's a rare phrase in the New Testament, and you've got to translate it according to the context but the basic meaning is casting lots. And if you cast lots, it's as if God is saying, I have cast a lot in favor of my church. I am inheriting my church. I am choosing my church to be my property, to be what I possess. And so the word has got those two senses of ownership and of ownership coming about because of choice. Because God chooses his lot and his inheritance to be the Old Testament Israel and the New Testament Israel of God, the church of Jews and Gentiles reconciled in Christ. So verse 11 is saying, in him you were chosen, in him you who believe were made heirs. And verse 14, the promised Holy Spirit has marked you. He is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Now, I think the fact that the language is clear about inheritance in verse 14 suggests to me that that's the thought in verse 11. I think the footnote translation is probably to be preferred over the main translation in verse 11. That's how the New Living Translation goes. Uh, that uh, verse in the New Living Translation is, furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for He chose us in advance, and He makes everything work out according to His plan. So, chosen to be heirs of God, God's heirs, and chosen for God until the day that our redemption draws near. Now, I don't know if you have ever inherited anything. Uh, maybe you've watched the TV program Air Hunters. Have you seen that, perhaps? And it may be 
has led to you daydreaming and thinking, I wonder if a solicitor will ever walk up my front lawn and come and ring my doorbell and say, surprise, there's a castle in Westeros with your name on it, or I don't know, maybe a small island in the Bahamas. That would be quite nice, wouldn't it? Oh, old Uncle Alistair finally came through. That kind of thing would be, would be rather fun. It's not likely, I suppose, to happen to very many of us that we get an unexpected inheritance, a surprise inheritance. I was reading recently about a rather sad woman, a very wealthy woman. She's uh, been dubbed the last Onassis. Um, You've heard of Aristotle Onassis, who made a a huge fortune out of shipping. He was a, a Greek citizen who traded in the middle part of the 20th century and made an absolute fortune out of international shipping. And he had a granddaughter, uh, Athena was her name, and she inherited the bulk, about 60% of the wealth of that shipping uh, business the day she turned 18. So people reckoned she was the only billionaire teenager in the world the day she turned 18. Well, she's now in her early 30s, and her life is full of difficulties. She's recently divorced after 10 years of marriage, a man who was not good to her and who let her down very badly. She's been seen on Prince Harry's arm. You can read that in the foreign press, not in the British press. That's the way that works. But you heard it here in Dingwall this morning. I'm sure they're just friends. But she's a sad person. With all that wealth, with all that inherited wealth, imagine getting into your 30s and never having worked a day in your life. Never having had a reason to get up in the morning and never having found someone you can trust to share your life with. I feel rather sad for the lady I don't think we maybe realize how that kind of inheritance can be a curse as much as a blessing. That kind of wealth, that kind of lifestyle can be a test. It can be a temptation. And it can lead to misery and to destruction of the soul. But if you are a Christian, you've heard the gospel and you've believed it by the grace of God, you are an heir of God. And you know that the Trinity of Father and of Son and of Spirit has made over a donation to you, has made over a gift to you of eternal life. And the gift, the donation that God has made to you is so astonishing that what God has given to you is himself. That's what God gives. If you hear a version of Christianity that sounds like you're going to join the Onassis family, and you're going to be dripping in jewels and dripping in gold, and you're going to have 14 garages and all the rest of it, your best life now, that's rubbish. Christianity is not about prosperity or wealth or or never being ill. Christianity is about whatever happens in life, good or ill, whether you go for a job and get it or not, whether you get engaged and have a happy marriage, or whether you remain single, whether you live long or whether you die young, whether you have a pain-free life or lots of stress and difficulty, you have God for your Father. You have Jesus for your brother. You are adopted into the family of God, and God is with you and is committed to ensure that you are with him forever. That's the inheritance. And that's better than waking up on your 18th birthday a billionaire It's better. 
And if you have Jesus Christ, truly God has given you every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms already. That's what we learned a few weeks ago. I want you to notice some of the little words, some of the family words, some of the personal pronouns that are used in this passage. And you'll find them all the way through. And it's, it's really quite striking if you look for them. Uh, verse 3, well, actually, verse 2, grace and peace to you from God our Father. Paul is writing to you, the Ephesians, the people who receive the letter, and he's talking about a group of people who can call God our Father. There's the you and there's the our. Verse 3, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. He's blessed us in the heavenly realms. Verse 4, he chose us in him. The end of verse 4 into verse 5, in love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons. And he did this to the praise of his glorious grace. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood. And he made known this mystery in verse 9, according to his good purpose, when the times will reach their fulfillment to bring us all together in one head, even Christ. Verse 11, in him we were chosen. In order, verse 12, that we, the first to hope in Christ, might be for his praise. And then verse 13, he goes away from us, away from we, to you again. Verse 13, and you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with the seal of the Holy Spirit. Did you notice that all through these verses, and it carries on through the rest of chapter 1 and into chapter 2, Paul is addressing two groups of people. There's a group of people who are the heirs of God that Paul calls us and we, and there are a group of people who are the heirs of God and calls them, God, Paul calls them you. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You heard the gospel of your salvation. Who are the us? Who are the we? And who are the you? It's one of the great themes of Ephesians that God brings about unity between two people who had nothing in common. Two people who didn't like each other, two people who didn't know each other, two people who didn't share anything in common. The pagan Gentiles who heard Jesus were separated and far away from the Old Testament believing remnant, the Old Testament church, if you like who had their hope in God. The Jews who heard of Jesus Messiah and believed in him, they are the people Paul is writing about, the we and the us. And the new people have come into the family of God from the nations, and this happened in his ministry in Ephesus when he was there for two and a half years. He began, spent several weeks with the Jews, and then he moved on and spent over two years with the Gentiles, and he built one church of Jewish background and Gentile background people who were heirs together and joint heirs together with Christ. And Ephesians is very careful to weave these two groups into one inheritance for God. And it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what you were before. It doesn't matter who your grandparents were. All that matters is to be able to say, I inherit the same salvation and the same glory as the rest of the church because now I am a man or a woman in Christ. So chapter 2 begins, As for you... You were dead in your transgressions and sins. You were slaves to Satan. Like all the rest of humanity, you were the objects of God's wrath. 
but because of his great love, God is rich in mercy. Verse 5 of chapter 2, he made us alive. He did it for Jewish people who believed in Jesus, and he did it for pagan people who believed in Jesus. He made us alive, and now we are one in Christ through the cross. What was God doing? Planning this inheritance for Jews and Gentiles. He was planning the church. And through the Holy Spirit, he calls individuals, as in verse 11, in him you were chosen, in him you were made heirs, in him you received the personal call, the effective, effectual call of the Holy Spirit. It came to you, and it brought you, whether you were Jewish with the Scriptures or Gentile with no background at all, he brought you to this place where you heard the voice of God and your dead soul woke up and your spiritual darkness became light and bright through the preaching of the gospel. Is it pointless to tell people the gospel? No, because the Holy Spirit is at work and God's heirs will hear and respond and believe. Is it pointless praying for people? No, because God by His Spirit works in people's hearts and He chooses to do that in answer to prayer. Is it pointless doing evangelism and witness and and sharing the gospel in all the creative ways you can come up with? No, because God has a chosen inheritance and He will use all these means to bring people to Himself. John Stott says, Let no one say that the doctrine of election by the sovereign will and mercy of God, mysterious as it is, makes either evangelism, sharing the news, or faith unnecessary. All this stuff in Ephesians 1 about God being the one who plans and purposes salvation, it should lead to evangelism, and it should lead to a response that should lead to personal faith and repentance. It's because God is doing all this choosing inheritance that there's any point in preaching the good news and that there's any point in praying and repenting and calling on God. And the shock in this passage is that Jews and Gentiles are being brought together onto the same footing so that it's no longer Israel is my firstborn, Israel is my inheritance, but that the whole church, all who turn to God and call on God, all who believe in the Christ of the cross, are God's inheritance. Now, something about the work of the Spirit in all of this. The second thing, sealed in the Spirit for our inheritance. The church is God's property, God's inheritance, but the church knows it's the church. The church knows it's the new Israel of God. The church knows it's got God's life and power and grace and salvation because the church has got the Holy Spirit. There is a mark, says Paul, of God's ownership and possession that we are his property. And so he says, verse 13, you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed. And the tenses, it's a a one-off thing. It's happened in the past, and it seems to be linking the experience of the Holy Spirit with the experience of hearing the gospel and believing it. It's not that there's two things going on, but that they happen together. They are linked. You're sealed in the Holy Spirit because you hear of Jesus, and by the grace of God, you believe in Jesus. You come to God through Jesus, And in coming to God through Jesus, you are marked with a seal of ownership, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance to the praise of his glory. What's a seal? It's out of fashion to use seals. If if you're a collector, you can collect all kinds of things. Some people collect... um, little bits of silver or tea sets or whatever. 
Maybe you've got a collection of uh, beautiful flies from fly fishing. I don't know what you're into or what you're, you're interested in, but some people collect seals. And I've met people who've got cabinets full of seals, maybe that would have been used to, to put a mark in wax when an important letter was being sent. And there are seals that are used in agriculture. When I was a child growing up, I remember my grandparents and their generation would keep uh, livestock. They would have sheep, and some of the neighbors had cattle, and they would brand some of these animals. If it was a sheep, it was usually in the horn, uh, and uh, something would be heated up, and maybe the address of the owner of these animals or something like that would uh, be put into the animal Uh, There are different ways of doing it now. There are more modern and more humane ways of doing that. But marking an animal, nowadays animals have a passport. They are chipped or they they have something tagging onto them so that you know who owned the animal, where it's been cared for, that it's had any treatment from the vet or whatever. There's a mark and it tells you who the owner is, and it tells you how that animal's life has been treated. We get that. We understand a mark of ownership, of responsibility, of possession. And Paul is saying Christian people are marked with God's ownership. They are sealed with the God saying over them, I possess you, I own you twice, because I made you, I created you, and in Christ I redeemed you. I brought you to myself at the cost of my own son. Now, how does God feel about the people that he owns? Well, he protects them. If you were to read on through the Bible to the last book of the Bible, to Revelation, you would read about sealing marking God's people in chapter 7. Now, admittedly, the language of Revelation can be, uh, the symbolism can be a bit overwhelming at times and and a bit mysterious at times, but it seems pretty clear that Revelation 7 is saying that the total church, everybody who belongs to the church can be thought of as the new tribes of Israel, the twelve tribes, and the total number, the whole church are there, and they are all sealed with the seal of God Almighty. They are marked as God's own property, the whole church from every age. And then you read on another couple of chapters, and you read in Revelation chapter 9 that God sends out his justice, his avenging angel, to, to deal with rebellion and sin and unbelief, and to punish and uh, bring about the the end of the world's rebellion and the beginning of a new creation and a new heaven and a new earth. And the angels with power to destroy and judge are told they are not to destroy the land. They are not to destroy the innocent living creatures. They are neither are they to touch God's sealed people who are marked as God as God's property. They were told, chapter 9, verse 4 of Revelation, they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So the symbolism of the seal is that if you are God's and the Spirit of God is in you because you are God's, you do not fear judgment day. You do not fear the wrath of the Lamb. You are safe and you are protected. And God says in his word from Genesis to Revelation, I possess my people with a possessive love. I love my people with a burning passion. They are mine and they shall be mine. And death cannot have them and Satan cannot have them. And they are protected by me. Now, I want to say to you, not only does the seal protect us, even from the wrath of God, but the seal of the Holy Spirit comforts us. Has it ever occurred to you that the reason that God gives the Holy Spirit to believers as his seal of ownership is not for anybody else's benefit? 
Nobody is going to come along and question God. Nobody in heaven or in hell or on the earth has a right to say to God, what are you doing with that woman or with that man? God is God. The seal is not there to authenticate what God is doing for, for some other authority. The seal of the Holy Spirit is there for our benefit. The seal says, because the Holy Spirit is in us and working in us and revealing Jesus to us, the Spirit says to us, here is the proof of God with you and of God's love for you. And that is supremely encouraging and comforting. There's an, another thing to say about the seal and that it is not a thing or an it, but it's a person. You were included in Christ when you heard the gospel, the word of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. The Spirit is a person. He is a person, not a thing or an experience. The Spirit is God himself coming and living inside of you. So the Spirit is a living seal. What's the proof that you're a Christian? That God is in you and that God is with you, that God is revealing himself to you, that God is saving you. Matthew Henry talks as well about this, about the idea of the Spirit being a deposit. And Paul has this language here and in a few other places. Verse 14, he is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Now, a deposit is when you get something and you know you'll get the rest of it later on. You pay a deposit. I'm going to buy a house, so I leave a deposit with the, the selling agent, and I'll arrange for the bank or the mortgage company to release the rest of the money later on. A deposit works like that. I'm going to buy something. I'm going to take that car that you're selling on Gumtree. Here's 50 quid. I'll be back tomorrow with the rest. But the Spirit... It's that kind of deposit. Because God says, here's the proof that I'm going to raise you from the dead. Here's the proof that you're going to be free of sadness and sorrow and disease and, and tears and temptation and sin. Here's the proof. Even though you're living in this broken world, I'm going to come and live in your house. I'm going to come and live in your family. I'm going to come and live in your marriage. I'm going to come and live in your soul. I'm going to be in your heart. I'm going to be in your mind. I'll be there when you're sleeping. I'll be there when you're waking. I'll be there today, and I'll always be there. Matthew Henry. The deposit makes it as sure to the heirs as though they already possessed it all. And it is purchased for them by the blood of Christ. Everything God is committed to do for you because of Jesus and his death, everything is sealed to you by the Spirit taking up residence within you and acting as a deposit. I don't know if you've put down a deposit on anything recently, but the deposit of the Holy Spirit is one that looks to the future. Our union with Christ will lead in Ephesians 2.22 to the sense of us being a temple, being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. And that makes us think back to the Old Testament where the tabernacle was filled with the glory cloud of God's presence. Where does God live today in this New Testament age that we're in? I think the answer is a two-parter. When God moves out of the tabernacle or the temple to be among his people, he sets up a new place for his glory to dwell among us, and that is the body of his Son. Jesus Christ is the glory cloud of God tabernacling among us. Just read the opening verses of John, and you will get that. But that's not enough. 
God wants not only to fill the body of the God-man, Jesus Christ, and say, here is my glory, and here is the meeting place of heaven and earth. God wants to build the church into union with Christ and gather the church around Christ so that Christ is the dwelling place for the Spirit and Christ's people united to him by faith are the growing temple, the growing new tabernacle, new temple filled as the body of Christ by the Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit is the down payment, the deposit that this work of a new creation where God is worshipped and loved and served in a perfect way, it has begun. And it has begun through the work of God in the church. It really troubles me when men and women who want to follow Jesus don't love the church and don't love their brothers and sisters in Christ, because you cannot be a Christian on your own. You're being built into a growing temple, and we need each other in the body of Christ to enter into this inheritance. The Spirit joins us to Jesus, but He also joins us to brothers and sisters. So we need to belong. We need to build each other up. We need to serve one another. We are given the Spirit so that we can be part of the family. We are given the Spirit so that we can be part of God's heritage. I'm sure you struggle, as we all struggle. I'm sure sometimes you feel overwhelmed. Sometimes you feel alone. Sometimes you feel helpless. But God's word to you today is, I have poured my Spirit out in you. I have given you my seal, that you are mine and I will protect you. You are mine and I will bless you. You are mine and I am in you. Now, grow in me and grow in loving and serving my people, your family, God's church. Isn't Ephesians a brilliant letter? I think when the Ephesians, the Jewish folk and the Gentile folk heard this, it would have shaken their thinking and it would have made them realize in a new way that what makes you a Christian is Christ living in you by the Spirit. And if God has done that thing for us, if that's our inheritance, we are blessed. We are blessed. Next Sunday, we will use another kind of sign, another kind of seal, bread and wine in the Lord's Supper. Some of you have been baptized, and that uh, water of baptism is a sign and a seal of the work of the Spirit and the work of salvation through Christ. Whatever, whether we're using outward signs, outward seals to strengthen faith, or whether we're using this sense of the Spirit himself as the inward and invisible seal, God is committed to saying to his church, you are mine, and I'll never give you up, and nothing and no one can separate you from my love. We worship you, Lord. We thank you for the seal of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps some of us here have not yet responded to the good news of the gospel, and we would love to have Christ as our Savior and the Spirit come and live within our hearts and minds. Will you grant us faith to turn to you from our life without God, from our idols and our selfishness, and to believe that Jesus died for our sins and is calling us to himself? Will you encourage us, Lord, to love you and to love your body, the Christian body, the church, where you live by your Spirit. Amen.